I've seen this. They don't like it. No. Pee Wee did it. Oh, man. But then he became like their king. I know. <laughs> Tequila. Hello, and welcome to Franchise Frights Podcast. I'm Cam. And I'm Andy. This is episode 22. Ooh. We're just steaming right on through them. Yeah. Guys, you know what would be super awesome? It would be super awesome if you would like, rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast, and also share, share it with all of your friends and family. Aww. Even if they don't like horror movies. I was just going to say, only the ones that like the fuck word, though. Oh, yeah. If you don't like the <laughs> fuck word, then this might not be the fucking podcast for you to listen to. No, especially, like, since working with, like, contractor type people, I just swear all the time now. Yeah. It's bad. I just swear all the time anyway. So, yeah. That's out of the way. We had somebody else hit us up for a sticker. Woohoo! So, if you want a sticker, you can hit us up just send us a direct message on any of our social media platform uh -huh. account majiggers. Or you can stop by our website and send us an email. And if we only do one at a time, maybe we'll get them sent to the right people. Yeah. There was a little <laughs> bit of a mix up. We sent two out at the same time. And, and even though I f really feel like I tried hard. <laughs> um. I must not have tried hard enough. I guess not. Yeah. It's okay. You're pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so what's been going on in our lives? My birthday came and went. Yeah. It's March. Mm-hmm. The weather's been beautiful. It has been. We have the windows open. Mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah. Do you have any horror movie news to relay? I do. You do? I do. Whoa. Um, you were going to let me watch it last night, and then we forgot, so I watched it this morning. I watched the trailer for The Strangers Chapter 1. Yes. Not really sure what to think about it. I'm pretty excited for it. I'm kind of excited for it, but it looks like it's pretty much just a remake of the first, which yeah. they said it was going to be, and they said the other two chapters aren't going to be similar to the second one of this first series. Uh-huh. That was a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It just, it looked interesting. I think it looks pretty brutal. It, that's what, uh, yes. That's what I didn't like about it. See, that's what I'm excited for. And even last night when we were watching The Stranger's Prey at Night, like, it was way more brutal than the first one. Yeah. I see. I liked the first one because it wasn't. See, I got really bored with the first one. I remember when it came out and everybody was like, Cam, you have to see this. It's like the best horror movie ever made. And I watched it. I'm like, it was pretty boring. Oh, see, I liked that because it was just like creepy and like. I've, I've grown to appreciate it now. Yeah. But when I first saw it, I was like, why was everybody telling me to watch this? I don't know. Because <laughs> they thought it was scary. Yeah. I have, I have two pieces of horror movie news. <gasps> you do? Yeah. But we already touched on one of them. Sorry. The trailer for The Strangers Chapter 1 is out now. Check it out. <laughs> and also, Doug Bradley said he would be open to returning to play an older version of Pinhead one last time if they want to make a movie out of the Scarlet Gospels book by Clive Barker because it deals with the end of Pinhead. Oh. And he said, if we did that, we could maybe present an older Pinhead to be aware of the fact that I'm the age I am and that time and gravity does what time and gravity does. Oh. I've never seen a Pinhead movie. Really? Mm-mm. Ooh. Maybe we need to start watching Hellraiser movies. They're, yeah. they're pretty gross. I, see, that's why I've never <laughs> seen one. 
He also said, an older, darker pinhead would intrigue me. One not so much in love with the flippant one-liners and the witty comebacks and so forth. But yeah, he just turned 70. Oh. So I think if he's going to don the, the makeup one more time. They better get it done. Yeah. Because I imagine he has to sit in the chair for a while. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I could be excited for that. How do you feel about the stills from The Crow? Uh, I feel very <laughs> upset about it. They pretty much turned The Crow into an AEW wrestler. Yeah. And I feel like they really went the Joker route from Suicide Squad. Mm -hmm. I'm not happy about it. But that's what edgy today looks like. Yeah, it's dumb. <laughs> okay, Grandpa. Paint his face white. <laughs> Do you have any other news to touch on? Nope. That's all I had. Well, guys, we're here today to review just a sterling example of how to make a great movie. It's, it's a cinematograph cinemagraphic. Cinemagraphic? <laughs> Cinemagraphic masterpiece. <laughs> Guys, we're talking about the movie Friday the 13th, Part 3. D. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. I like to throw the D in. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give you some facts and figures on it since this is Mandy's movie to review. Yay! Friday the 13th, Part 3. D was released on August 13th, 1982. It stars Dana Kimmel, Paul Kratka, Richard Brooker, Larry Zerner, Tracy Savage, and Catherine Parks. It was directed by Steve Miner and written by Martin Kitroser and Carol Watson. It was produced by Frank Mancuso Jr., cinematography by Gerald File. I think that's how I'd you... say it, File. Music by Harry Manfredini and Michael Zeger. How can we say, we just like no words like Manfredini, but we can't say file. <laughs> the production company was Jason Inc. It was distributed by Paramount Pictures with a runtime of 95 minutes. Its budget was $2.2 million or $7 million today. Box office take was $36.7 million or $117 million today. So it's a pretty heavy hitter. Mm-hmm. It has an IMDb score of 5.6 out of 10. Hmm. I don't I don't get that. <laughs> but it does have a Rotten Tomatoes critic score of 7%, which yeah. I feel is it, more in line with how I feel about the movie. That's pretty low. And a 42% audience score. I think people are smoking drugs. You think so? I think so. The Rotten Tomatoes critics consensus says Jason may solidify his iconic wardrobe in this entry, but Friday the 13th Part 3 lacks any other distinguishing features, relying on a tired formula of stab and repeat. But that's what these movies are. Yeah. Do you expect more? If I want to watch a Friday the 13th movie, I don't want a big plot. No. I, I really don't want good acting. You, you just want to like see some bad actors, see some boobs, and see some blood. Yeah. And you know what? This movie delivers. Yeah. Do you have any reviewers? I do. Janet Maslin of the New York Times says, as in each of the other recent 3D movies, of which this is easily the most professional, there is a lot of time devoted to trying out the gimmick. Tilts loom towards you, yo-yo spin, popcorn bounces, snakes start toward the camera and strike. <gasps> Eventually, the novelty wears off, and what remains is the now familiar spectacle of nice, dumb kids being lopped, chopped, and perforated. Yeah. Yeah. It's very accurate. I also had a quote from Janet Maslin of the New York Times. You do? Part three isn't any more vicious or clever than its predece predecessors, which were a lot more vicious than clever, to be sure. But it's a little more adept at teasing the audience. Yeah. There's some good stalking scenes. Mm -hmm. I'll give it that. Yeah. Uh, Linda Gross. Her last name's Gross. Ew. <laughs> of Los Angeles Times wrote, Iconically, Friday the 13th Part 3 is so terrible that Friday the 13th Part 1 and Friday the 13th Part 2 don't seem so bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
an unknown writer from TV Guide, because they do not credit their writers, said, exploits precisely the same formula plot as its predecessors, Through the go- or though the gore is a bit de-emphasized, with the special effects crew con- concentrating on the nicely done 3D depth work for a change. It's still trash, however, and also made a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have for reviewers. Yeah. I don't know that I'd ever seen this one before I watched it. I- really? I hadn't subjected you to this? I don't think so. Uh, just put going in, I don't have high hopes, but we'll see. And it's in 3D, so can it be that bad? Oh, yeah. It can be. <laughs> I said, absolutely classic, campy 80s slasher horror at its best and its worst. It has everything we know and love and know and hate about the genre. Mm-hmm. This was a staple of like sleepovers and stoned movie nights and riffing sessions for me. And it's a fun part of a marathon. Yeah. I like to, uh, sometimes I like to sit down and watch two or three movies in a row that were all made in the same year. And this would be a fun 1982. Mm-hmm. But this is not a good movie. <laughs> but it is a good time. Yes. That's all I had to say. Yeah. Would you like to get into the plot rundown? I, I guess we're going to. Well, it's easy because the Friday the 13th movies always start out with the first six to ten minutes of the previous movie. Yes, we get to watch the entire climax to the second (laughs) film. So once again, we get the first six minutes of the previous movie to start this one. Because, you know, the plot is so complicated, they want to make sure that you're up to date. You really need to be caught up. You got to know what's going on. Yeah, I would have been lost. Yeah. So Ginny runs to Jason's shack looking for someone to help her. As Jason approaches, she locks herself in the back room and discovers Mrs. Voorhees' head and sweater, along with candles and a couple dead bodies. The dead bodies give it weight. (laughs) Jason breaks the door down as Ginny puts on the sweater and pretends to be Mrs. V, telling Jason what a good job he's done. At first, Jason sees Ginny as Mrs. Voorhees. He calms down and kneels in front of her like she asked him. She raises the machete she's been hiding behind her. Did I just like shh? A little bit, yeah. (laughs) Okay. You were a bit windy. (laughs) I felt like the old man on Family Guy. (laughs) (laughs) Looking for some of that good news. She raises the machete she's been hiding behind her, swings it at Jason, but when she does, Jason gets a glimpse of Mrs. V's head behind her. He, Jason uses his pickaxe to block Ginny's blow, and then he gashes her in the leg. Ouch. And then, is his name Paul? I didn't go back up to look at it, yes. but I felt like it was Paul. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Paul shows up and begins wrestling Jason. Jason is on top of him and about to hit him with a pickaxe when Ginny grabs the machete and buries it into Jason's neck. He falls to the ground. Ginny unmasks him, but they don't show his face. And then she and Paul leave the shack. Then back inside, after they've left, Jason stirs. He's very bloody and starts to drag himself across the floor. There's a close-up of Mrs. V's head as Friday the 13th Part 3 flies in 3D towards the screen. Right out of her head. (laughs) The theme song is terrible. Oh, it's so disco funky. And it reminds me so much of the Doctor Who th- Who theme, but like funked up. I don't know the Doctor Who theme, but I know that this song is funky and fresh. And boy, it sure gets me in the mood for a horror movie. It, it's the exact opposite of horror movie music. It's that like synthy. Yeah, Mandy like, just wah. played the Doctor Who theme for me. <laughs> and it does have a lot of similarities. Yes, when I listened to it, I was like... This sounds so much like the Doctor Who theme. But disco-y. Yeah. Cam's not a nerd like me. No. I spend my time watching good things like Friday the 13th Part 3. Yeah. So we open with a panning shot of a cabin. A woman opens a window and bitches at her husband for running into the clothesline. She watches TV and a report about the Camp Crystal Lake murders informs viewers that eight bodies have been found gruesomely murdered. I like, too, that she's telling him he's a slob, and then she's sitting there in a moo with rollers in her hair. <laughs> um, they say the only, only survivor was Ginny Field in serious condition. 
And I put, oh, we're going hard with the 3D already. Oh, yeah. The wife hears a commotion outside. She looks out the window again, and she sees a man in the clothesline. Assuming it's her husband, but we know it's Jason. Oh, because we get the ch 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 Yes. On the TV, the reporter continues that the suspect is still at large. And did you notice all the beer cases stacked up just like right outside the store? There were like 30 beer cases just like stacked up back there. Yeah, but they might have like, they had a store. They might have stocked them. I know, but like, what if they were not empty and like then the teens could just come get all the free beer? (laughs) Is that what you thought of? Yeah. Okay. I'd go steal all that beer. The wife goes outside and she grabs a basket to put laundry in and starts to remove the laundry from the line. She sees a man at the end of the line and she bitches at her husband, who is Jason, some more. That she's the only one who ever does anything around here. Jason silently walks away and the wife runs into the house. Inside their attached grocery store, the husband feeds his fish. He tries some of their food. Mm Mm-hmm. And he thinks it's tasty. Which he enjoys until he looks at the ingredients. And what is, he, he's like, mayfly eggs. And then he starts <laughs> spitting. Yeah. He spots a rabbit sitting on the produce. He picks it up and on, on his way back to the front of the store, he opens a jar of peanuts, eats a handful, and then puts the lid back on them. It's his store. Then he opens a bottle of juice, takes a swig, and puts the <laughs> lid back on it. Oh, and it's like, like a Sunny D bottle. Mm-hmm. And as soon as he took that swig, I was like, ooh, vodka. I was, I just put, and this is why we have seal-proof food now. Yes. <laughs> In the window behind him, Jason lurks unseen. The wife comes from behind the husband and startles him. And then she bitches at him some more for eating too much, not losing weight, and for having the rabbit out. Then she storms back in the house. The husband grabs himself another donut before taking the rabbit to the barn. The husband likes to eat. And did you notice how dirty and gross he is? Yeah. I wouldn't want to buy anything from him. Yeah. I'd walk into the store and be like, no, I don't think I want hepatitis with my peanuts. Thank you. I'm guessing they're like the only store around. Yeah, like that little general store on the lake. Yep. Inside the barn, the rabbit gets very worked up and jumps from the man's arms. He questions why it's so nervous until he looks into the cage and finds all the other rabbits dead. Oh no, who did it? A 3D snake (gasps) springs at the man who takes off running for the house. And we think he's just running away because he's scared. (laughs) But no, it scared the shit out of him. Inside, the wife sits down to continue knitting, but she can't find one of her needles. The husband runs in straight for the bathroom and she yells at him, yeah. So she yells at him that it's the food he's been eating. <laughs> <laughs> On the toilet, the dude dumps. He reaches over some crates and pulls out a bottle of booze he has hidden. That's probably why you're ta- you have the shits, dude. Like, quit eating junk and... And downing Jack Daniels with <laughs> yeah. it. Across the room from him, curtains start to move a little. The man stands up to have a look. He pulls up his pants, doesn't wipe his ass. He just nope. pulls his pants right up over his poopy, poopy butt. You gotta wipe after you poop. <sighs> I don't care how, how scared you are if you think something's over there. Yeah. You know what? Just wipe. wipe. And then you'll be better equipped to fight the evil that's coming. Exactly. He pulls back the curtain and sees nothing. He checks behind a couple of doors, each time the music building with nothing there. He opens the final door and gets a chest. Nope. Gets a knife to the chest, courtesy it's, of Jason. It's a meat cleaver. Oh, is it? Yeah. And it really accentuates Harold's pocket protector. It's like he kind of sticks his chest out with the cleaver, like gets buried into him. You're like, man, it's a nice pocket protector. It's nice. That guy's worried about his pocket. That's good to know. Yeah, even though it looks like he pooped on the back of his shirt. Like, yep, it's a good thing you're protecting that pocket on your pocket t-shirt. He probably did poop on the back of his shirt. Probably. So the wife hears the husband groan, so she enters the bathroom. She calls his name with no response. And she opens a curtain and screams as an albino rat runs across a plank of wood. Oh, can you imagine that in 3D? Because it came right at the camera. I know. Ooh. <laughs> she slowly backs up to the door. Jason punches out the glass, grabs her by the head, and jams her knitting needle into the back of her head. 
It's a pretty good kill. Yeah. A group of teens driving a van stops at a house to pick up a friend. Well, not just a van. That van <laughs> is sweet. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. It's got like... <laughs> It's that like light metallic blue, and then it has dark blue and yellow like effects going yeah. down the side. It has one of those little round windows up in the back. It's a nice van. I love it. I'd live in that van. I know you would. Down by the river. Down by the river. <laughs> so a group of teens driving a van stops at a house to pick up a friend. We have a nerdy, curly-haired guy. His jockish, jockish friend. Is he? I, He's not really jockish, but he feels that way at the beginning. Well, I think it's just because he's wearing like a letterman's jacket. I think so too. We have the jock guy's girlfriend and a girl driving the van. They stop to pick up another girl who is supposed to be the curly head dude's date. And they all stand on the porch and make introductions. And the mom does not want her to go. No, they have to argue. Yes. They yell at each other. Someone from the group turns around and sees smoke rolling out of their van. Thinking it's on fire, they run to take a look. But it was actually just their two stoner friends taking bong rick rips and hot boxing the back of the van. What I don't get is all these kids look like they're probably like very early college age. Yeah. And this is like their spring break. Why are they hanging out with two 40 year old stoner people? I don't know. <laughs> Were they just like, oh, if we hang out with them, we get to smoke their weed. Yeah, they'll bring the weed. But like these people are clearly older than the rest of them. <laughs> yeah. The group sets off. The stoner couple are sitting in the back with the curly head dude and his date. Up front, the jock looking dude and his girlfriend, who we find out is pregnant. Pregante. And Chris is the girl that is driving the van. A cop car turns on its lights and sirens and starts to follow the van. Everyone panics because they all have pot. So to get rid of it, they all decide that eating it is the best course of action. Um, I've heard that if you just eat like raw weed like that, it makes you poo a lot like Harold. So maybe he was eating weed. Maybe. You're definitely not going to get high off of it. You're just going to have a gross taste in your mouth. Yeah. Oh, and Andy, the jock dude. And he's got it like full in his teeth. And yeah. He's like, it looks like he's like in the middle of like munching down a spinach salad. Yeah. So Chris finally pulls over and the cops fly on by. So they ate their weed for nothing. Yeah. The cops pull into a shop where they're loading dead bodies into the back of an ambulance. Is that Harold's store? It sure looks like it. Oh, no. The kids watch and then continue down the road until the pregnant girl yells at Chris to stop the van. There's a dude passed out in the middle of the road. They wake him, and he assumes he's in heaven. <laughs> yeah, he looks up at the three pretty ladies and then Shelly, the curly-headed dork man. Yeah. And is like, I must be in heaven. <laughs> and then he pulls an, <laughs> out an eyeball to show the kids. And he tells them that he wanted him to have the eyeball. And he wanted him, them, nope. He wanted them, nope. He wanted him to warn them. <laughs> and I like that he's holding the eyeball out in front of him and yes. going, I have warned thee. It's weird and gross. He's the new Ralph. Yeah, I get it. So the, can the kids are like, fuck this, and I'll get back in the van. The van pulls up to a cabin. From inside, we see someone in a plaid shirt peeking out the window at the kids. Everyone jumps out, excited to take a look around the lake. But Chris decides she wants to take her bags inside and look around some before going to the water. She gets to the door of the cabin, cabin prepared to unlock it, but the door is already slightly ajar. Uh-oh. That's not good news. No. She opens it and cautiously walks in. She calls hello. No one answers. Suddenly, the guy in the plaid shirt jumps out, grabs her, and starts to kiss her. And uh, she looks like she's maybe 19. Uh -huh. And he looks like he's like 36. Uh -huh. So I'm just going to go ahead and say that he's a pedo. Yeah. I mean, she's of age and everything. But once we get the backstory, we know that they've been together off and on for a while. Yeah. He is creepy. We find out his name is Rick, and he looks like he's about 10 years older than Chris. At least. Chris goes on to explain that it's been two years since she's been back to the cabin, and it seems like something bad happened. Yes, there's a backstory here. And apparently, it's been two years since she's seen Rick. And then Rick looks at her, and he has like a crazy deep voice, too. Yeah. 
And he's like, you've certainly changed in two years. Yeah, she's not 16 anymore, yeah. so go away. Um, And she wants to get to know him before they fuck. Uh-huh. <laughs> they walk to the van to bring in the rest of the bags, and Chris notices the van door is open, even though it wasn't earlier. And the van door is covered in sweet blue shag carpeting. <laughs> She scolds herself for being scared, and she starts to lean into the van to grab some bags, and an arm grabs her from inside the van. It's the curly-headed dude. His name is Shelly. It is. And he accidentally scares her, but then he apologizes. So Chris asks him why he's not down at the lake with the others, and Shelly explains that the others were going skinny dipping, and he's not skinny enough. Aww. Poor Shelly. It's okay. He's a douche. So later, the, the, Chris shows the pregnant chick to her bedroom. She opens the curtains and peeks outside and notices that the barn door is open. Pregnant girl inquires about the bed, not seeing one, and Chris shows her a hammock. Uh-huh. I don't think that's safe. Why? I don't think it's safe to just sleep in a hammock. and like, it's going to be two people sleeping in there, and that's just like anchored into the wall with a like, little eye hook. <laughs> I don't feel like it's safe. Okay. Chris and Rick unload hay, even though they have no need for hay. Yeah, and they even explain that there's no need for hay. <laughs> and Chris explains her dad always means to buy horses. What the fuck? Like, he always means to buy a horse, but he never does. But every year he buys all this hay. I don't buy dog food just in case I might buy a dog. <laughs> Can you imagine? I bet there's somebody out there that does that. They're like, <laughs> well, you know, just in case I end up with a cat, I should probably have a bunch of cat food on hand. That's weird. I like, too, that Rick is, like, kind of nagging Chris here. And he's like, yeah. you know, I had the chance to hang out with, I don't know what her name was. Mary. Juice Newton. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I gave up on that to come hang out with you. Did that work in the 80s? I hope not. Like, you better put out because, you know, I could have been banging somebody else right my, now. Because my response would have been like, okay, go over to Juice Newton's house. Yeah. So they goof around some and suddenly they hear a scream. They both run to the cabin and Chris tells Rick she'll check upstairs and he can take downstairs. Upstairs, Chris checks each room, calling out and asking if anyone is there. She hears kind of a thud come from, like, a is it a wardrobe? What do you yeah. Armoire? Armoire. She slowly opens the door and out falls Shelley's lifeless body. He has an axe buried into his head. Chris screams and Rick runs to help her. The others arrive at the cabin at the same time and everyone panics and Rick asks, asks if he's dead. Baby daddy, whose name is Andy, Andy. bends over and tickles Shelley and Shelley immediately loses his cool and reveals to everyone it was just a joke. But no one thinks it was funny. Did you notice, too, that, like, Chris tried to open that door and it wouldn't open? So she, like, karate kicks it and it sounds like the entire door frame breaks. Like, the sound effect is, like, <laughs> <laughs> like the door frame broke and then she goes in and the door frame's, like, completely fine. Yeah. Like, come on. Get your sound effects right. Yeah. So Shelly's date asked to borrow Rick's car to go to the store. Shelly asks to tag along, and she pretty much tells him no and leaves him in the dust. But then, like, a couple yards later, she stops the car and lets him get in. I, I just have to say, I absolutely hate Shelly. Like, for the actor who played him is terrible. Uh -huh. He can't act for shit. No. Which makes him perfect for this movie. Yeah. He's a douchey asshat. Yeah. And when I play the Friday the 13th game... I get so excited when Shelly is in the mix and I get to go kill him. I'm like, oh, I'm doing one of the signature kills on this boy. I will stalk him to get to a window so I can do the like break through the window and like bend his head backwards yeah. over the frame kill because I just I want to kill him so badly in that game. Okay. I just had to get my feelings That's, out. I'm glad that you expressed those feelings. Yes. It's good to talk things out. It is. Later, Chris and Debbie, the pregnant chick, walk through a field together. And Chris tells Debbie that she's been hearing and seeing things since they arrived and that maybe she came back too soon. Maybe it's just too soon. For what? From what? I don't know. 
Hopefully she tells us later very dramatically. (laughs) Debbie assures her that nothing can happen if they're all there together. Aww. At the store, Shelly and his date encounter some rough and tumble gang members. I know they're gang members because they're wearing leather and chains. (laughs) Yeah. And boy, they sure do look tough and nothing like actors who have just done their hair up tough. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So they get into a little altercation inside the store and they make their way out and Shelly drives since the girl's still worked up about the incident. And her acting. The way I feel right now, I would probably get us in an accident. Yes. (laughs) So one of the gang guys comes outside. Shelly starts the car and then puts it in reverse instead of first gear and slams into the gang's motorcycles behind them. I've seen this. They don't like it. No. Pee Wee did it. Oh, man. But then he became like their king. I know. (laughs) Tequila. Shelly slams the car into first and takes off. But the gang member steps in front of the car. And then Shelly just decides to stop the car for some reason. And And smile at him. Instead of steering around him. The gang dude looks like Dave Chappelle. And he has a big chain and uses it to break two windows inside the bug. So Shelly finally takes off. The gang member runs to his bike to chase after them, but Shelly's feeling brave. He whips the car around and drives over the other guy's bike. Yes. The other guy has to jump away. So, so far we've seen Shelly dress up in a scary mask Mm -hmm. and act like he's stabbing his friend Andy in the back to scare everybody. He puts himself in an armoire with a toy axe in his head and fake blood Mm -hmm. to scare everybody. Now he's driving a Ted Bundy style car (laughs) and he goes back and does some psycho shit by running over the motorcycle man's motorcycle in his Ted Bundy car. Yeah. Kind of worried about Shelly. Back at the lake, Andy plays with a yo-yo for a very long time. But wow, it's in 3D. Oh, I bet that was so good. Can you imagine being stoned in that theater and that (laughs) yo-yo coming down at your face? And I I made a note here, too, that Debbie is such a bad actress that she doesn't even realize the yo-yo hit her in the face. Yeah. The yo-yo hits her in the nose, uh-huh. and she goes, hey, watch it. That one was close. Yeah. It, it hit you. That wasn't close. That was impact. Shelly and his date arrive back with groceries and the smashed up bug. And Vera tells everyone how Shelly took care of the situation. He's so brave. He is brave. He's a brave boy because he's Ted Bundy. (laughs) Rick's pissed that his car is smashed and he tells Chris that he's going to leave. She asks him to stay because she wants to be with him. Oh. And they compromise and she gets in the car. Does Chris remind you of Linda Blair a little bit? A little, yeah. Like this scene right here where she's talking to Rick and she's like, please stay for me. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she looks so much like Linda Blair. I get that. And Rick's standing there with his sweater draped over his shoulders. <laughs> He's a douche. And meanwhile, we get the Jason music as somebody watches from the barn. <gasps> Do you think it's Jason? Maybe. Debbie asks Andy to go swimming with her. She persuades him by telling him they'll be all alone and they can do whatever they want. And I like how he responds to her. He's like, sounds disgusting. I'm in. <laughs> Debbie tells Andy to go on ahead. She's going to run and grab some towels. Out of sight, we see that the gang, motorcycle gang, has found their way to the cabin. As payback, they plan to siphon the gas out of the van. The woman seems apprehensive, but her boyfriend tells her that no one will get hurt. It's just retaliation. And I like, too, that they growl at each other like dogs to communicate. Like that one guy stands over there. He's like, And then the other guy comes over like, oh, that's the signal for me to walk over here. And I put, okay, someone is definitely going to get hurt. And Uh, retaliation, it it, this seems like a little rascal's plot. Well, they were going to go light the the barn on fire. I know. I I get to that. But at this point, I was like, (laughs) oh, we're just going to steal their gas. Like, that's a little rascal's thing. Yeah. The guys go about their business while the woman, Fox. Fox. Decides to check out the barn. She messes around with random objects, smiling at everything like she's never seen farm stuff before. And I like when she first sees the barn and she sneers like Billy Idol. (laughs) Like, okay, Billy Idol. Yeah. The score gets louder and behind her, we see the feet and legs of a person. 
She falls down and almost lands face first into a pitchfork. She's a little freaked out but recovers. And then she sees the ladder to the loft and begins to climb. Back outside, one t- guy tells the other to go start pouring the gas in the barn. This is where I put, okay, maybe a little more hardcore than Little Rascals. <laughs> the guy gets to the barn just as Fox jumps out of the loft, swinging on the bale pulley. Oh, she's like up in the hayloft and she's swinging on the rope that comes yeah. out. He scolds so, her for messing around. She's so tough, but she's whimsical and likes rope swings. Yeah. He scolds her for messing around and he looks down for a moment and then back up to the loft and Fox is gone. And right here, when like we get to see him close up in the right lighting, uh-huh. he looks so much like Ethan Hawke. Uh, He's like dirty, <laughs> slicked back hair Ethan Hawke. I guess I didn't really pay attention. Maybe that was just me. Maybe I just like like to see Ethan Hawke. Yeah. You know, so I just project. Oh, I want to watch that Ethan Hawke movie tonight. Oh, yeah, that one? Um, <laughs> it's, it's like with the movie. It's like with the movie. Yeah. <laughs> that Ethan Hawke movie. It's a scary one. Sinister? Yeah. Oh, I'd watch that. Okay. Oh, Sidetrack. <laughs> ADD. He enters the building, telling Fox to come out and stop screwing around. He climbs the ladder to the loft, telling her that she's dead now. And then he finds her with a pitchfork through her neck, hanging from a support beam. Hey, he was right. She is dead now. It's it's true. Before he can react, he's impaled impaled through the stomach with another pitchfork. How many pitchforks do you need? If you're in a hayloft, you definitely need more than one. You do? You think just one person's up there messing with the hay? I don't know. I don't know shit about shit. <laughs> <laughs> I stay inside. I don't do all this horse stuff. No, there would you would probably have several pitchforks. I'm not a horse girl. Because once you get like the, I have a hard time, the bales of hay. Uh-huh. I always want to say hails of bay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to like really think about it. Once you get the hay bales up there then you break them down like uh-huh. you don't leave them in the square you break them down and that's what the pitchfork's for oh. and then you use it to put into your stable things where the horses are oh and then that's how the horses eat i thought they just laid on the hay <laughs> the horses eat the hay horses eat hay they lay on straw oh <laughs> <laughs> i learn something new every day yeah. Uh, the last gang member is Ali, and he goes inside the barn yelling at his accomplices to come out. He looks up at the loft just as his male companion is thrown down onto him. He's freaked out. Yeah, and I like that he kind of catches him. Yeah. He like cradles him in his arms. And then until he sees he's dead, and then he's like, fuck that. He's like, ew, get off me. You're dead. He screams for Fox, but instead Jason jumps down from the loft. <laughs> he like ninja drops. <laughs> He's like, I'm Batman. Ali grabs a machete, and then Jason hits Ali and knocks him to the ground, and then beats or stabs him to death. He raises his arm a lot, Yeah, and there's thumping noises. Outside the barn window, Jason watches Debbie and Andy making their way back to the cabin from swimming. Andy's walking on his hands. He does that a lot. Uh Uh-huh. He's talented. Andy's, there's just so much douche in this movie. (laughs) That night, Rick and Chris sit by a pile of rocks. <laughs> and a drainage pipe. I, I, like, it's so romantic. I feel like they're on the lake still, but they're just... And there's like that drainage pipe off to like the left of the screen. <laughs> but... Like, oh yeah, just sit there by the standpipe. I know, and then Rick says he couldn't imagine living anywhere else. Uh-huh. And, and it was 1982, so it's probably raw sewage probably. coming in through that pipe. <laughs> He tells Chris that he loves the peace and quiet. Chris tells him it can be deceiving. Is she going to tell us what happened? I I don't know. Rick asks her why she even came back, and she replies she's trying to prove something to herself. And then Rick whines a bunch that he's not getting any, saying that she's putting a barrier up between them. Play with my pee-pee. Does that work for you, Rick? (laughs) At the, the cabin, the stoner couple are passed out on the couch while Andy and Shelly have a juggling competition. Oh, man, and the juggling in 3D, the, the apples and oranges are coming yeah. right at your face. 
Debbie and Vera watch on, looking very bored. Debbie gets up and lures Andy away by telling him she can think of better things to do with his hands. Honka, honka. I mean, she's already pregnant. What's going to happen? Yeah. Might as well just bang it out. Once they're alone, Shelly confesses to Vera that he likes her. And maybe they could... But she places his hand over his mouth to say no. She tells him she's going to go outside for a bit, and then they can talk. Shelly's defeated. And he calls her a bitch. Yeah. Like, she gets out of earshot, and he's like, bitch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he should die. <laughs> Shelly watches, watches her out the window for a moment, and then goes to stoke the fire. Behind him, we see Jason walk past the same window in the direction of Vera. And then there's a really fucking awkward shot, and it's just Shelly sitting by the fire, filmed from behind, and you think something scary is going to happen. And then he just turns around and smiles. Well, it's just showing that he put the fireplace poker in there. And then he got the idea to go outside, and he left the poker in the oh. fire. Oh. That makes sense. Because I was like, that's fucking weird. Upstairs, Andy and Debbie discuss the logistics of hammock sex. <laughs> I wrote the physics of hammock sex. <laughs> <laughs> And back at the lake, Rick and Chris are t still talking. She finally tells him what happened that night. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad she tells us. Rick had dropped her off late, and she knew her parents would be waiting, but she didn't care because she had such a good time with him. She and her parents got into a huge fight, and her mom slapped her. Oh my gosh. Not slapping. So Chris ran out into the woods to escape. She had planned to stay out there all night to scare her parents. Like a 12-year-old. Yep. And, and she... Rick was like, oh, God, this is the hottest you've ever been. <laughs> she fell asleep under a tree and woke up to the sound of footsteps. She thought it was her dad, but instead it was a hideous, almost inhuman man attacking her. And he had a machete. Machete. But she fought hard and kicked the knife out of his hand. He tackled her to the ground, gained control, and began to drag her through the woods and then she blacked out she can't remember anything after that my favorite thing about this whole speech is I, I, okay i'm gonna break it down in three parts number one holy shit she cannot act <laughs> yeah <laughs> number two the far off look she has in her eyes uh -huh. while she's saying all of this <laughs> and number three that we have her face telling the story like superimposed over the scene yeah. that she's describing and it's so cheesy it's so bad uh -huh. and you know I love it when she woke up she was back in her own bed she teleported her parents never said a word about it all she wants to do is forget that horrible face so I kind of have <laughs> maybe this is like my fan fiction about this I think Chris's mom just slapped her so hard she knocked her out and she had a nightmare and her dad was like, I'm just going to take her up to bed. I'm going to go set her in the woods for a while and then take her to bed. I think the whole Woods and Jason thing was just a nightmare and her mom just like cold cocked her and her dad was like, I'll just take her up and put her in her bed now before my wife knocks me out too. So just then the battery on the bug dies yeah, big surprise the vw <laughs> dies and what is it with this series and shitty vehicles they, they like vws well and in the first one there were two jeeps yeah it's like boy you guys are really maybe that's all they could afford to rent probably and rick tells her that it does that sometimes he can't get it started so he grabs the flashlight and tells her they're going to have to walk back but he knows a shortcut oh good Stoner Dude wakes up and goes out into the outhouse to poop and smoke a J. The outhouse begins to shake, and at first he thinks it's just some really good weed. Yeah, like after he takes half of a hit off of a joint, the outhouse shakes, and he's like, good shit, man. <laughs> also, why is there an outhouse? Because we establish here in just a couple of minutes that There's there is bathroom. indoor plumbing in this house. But maybe it's just left over, you know, because like at one point, they needed an outhouse, and so they're just like, hey, it's our second bathroom. Yeah. Or if, like, you ha if you're at the lake and have to go pee. Oh, yeah, you can just run out real quick. Well, I guess if you're in a lake, you could probably just pee in the lake. Yeah. I mean, I'd poop in the lake, too. That's weird. I mean, <laughs> lakes are nature's bidet. <laughs> but the more it shakes, he realizes that it's really happening. 
He pulls up his pants, goes outside, and just catches the silhouette of a person walking away towards the barn. He assumes it's Shelly playing jokes again. And then he turns the corner of the outhouse and runs straight into this, oh, his lady, scaring them both. And he gets up without wiping, too. Yeah, yeah I just kind of skipped over that part because I... Nobody wipes their bums in this movie. Traumatized. He tells her about the incident, and she tells him they should give Shelly a taste of his own medicine. So they sneak into the barn, search for Shelly for a minute, but they don't find him. And meanwhile, we see Jason lurking and watching them. And we find out that Tommy Chong clone's girlfriend's name is Chili. Oh, is it? Her name is Chili. I kind of like that. I don't. <laughs> that's, that's food. Okay. So Vera sits on the deck, her feet dangling above the water. Never do this at night. That's just like... <sighs> that's just asking for it. Yeah. And suddenly a black hand reaches out of the water and grabs her foot, trying to pull her in. She kicks and screams and is finally able to scramble away. She cries and backs up on the dock, and suddenly Shelly jumps out of the water, wearing the iconic Jason hockey mask, a wetsuit, and carrying a harpoon. Uh huh. <laughs> Uh, this kid has problems. I have a lot of questions. I do too. Like, when is he going to be committed? So Vera is pissed and asks him why he always has to play these stupid jokes. Shelley tells her he's doing it to impress her. It's better to be the jokes guy than to be nothing at all. Oh, Shelley, you poor boy. I like too that he tells her, let this be a lesson to you. A beautiful girl like you shouldn't go outside at night by herself. Yeah, because there might be somebody half as creepy as Shelly out there. <laughs> Vera assures him that he doesn't, that she doesn't think he's nothing. But sad, mopey Shelly mopes off on his own. Shelly gonna die. Yep. <laughs> Vera walks to the dock and sits again. And Shelly makes his way to the barn, still carrying the hockey mask. He walks around the barn and starts yelling out for Cheech and Chong, because that's what I call them. <laughs> I didn't know what their names were. Chuck and Chili. And this scene goes on for way too long. Uh huh. <laughs> they show him walking up to the barn, walking around the barn, walking into the barn. And when he walks into the barn, he goes, Hey, you guys doing something in here I shouldn't see? Yeah. Uh, Shelly enters the barn and turns on the light. And when he turns around, there's a, a mummified horse's head? What is that? I wrote a cow head covered in dust and cobwebs falls out of the ceiling. Okay, it's either a horse or a cow, but it's like mummified. Why was that there? I don't know, especially if they never have horses. I think Chris's dad has some splaining to do. Hmm. At the dock, Vera looks through a wallet. I assume it's Shelley's wallet. Yeah. Okay. Something startles her and she drops the wallet into the water. Luckily, it floats, but she reaches from the dock and she can't grab it. So she walks down to the shore, removes her shoes, and enters the water to get it. Behind her, we see a man wearing the mask Shelly was carrying. She sees him, too, and apologizes for dropping his, water, his wallet into the water. But when she gets a closer look, she realizes it's not Shelly. And she asks the man who he is. So this is the point where you do not engage with the scary person. Nope. You run. Mm-hmm. Or better yet, you're in the water. Swim. I'm going to swim to the other side of the lake. Yeah. And then I'm going to run. And then not stop running. Yeah. I wrote, swim, evade, do not just stand. So the man responds by lifting up the harpoon, aiming, and shooting her dead center in the eye. I like it. I put, okay, this was a pretty bad introduction to the iconic Jas Jason look. He is fucking massive. Uh-huh. The hockey mask is scary. And the special effects here were actually pretty great. And when the harpoon is flying at the screen. Yeah. My, I wonder how they got that shot. Wow, it looked really good. It did. Jason drops the harpoon and makes his way to the cabin. Upstairs, Andy and Debbie finish up their hammock sex. And then she gets up to take a shower. Immediately after. Yes. There's no cuddling or anything. No, she's done. She's pregnant. Let her be. Yeah. As Debbie showers, we see Jason slowly wake, making his way upstairs. Andy calls out to Debbie and tells her that he's going to grab a beer and asks if she wants one. Um, pregnant. It's okay. She's in the first trimester. <laughs> <laughs> De 
Debbie doesn't answer him, but a few moments later, she hears the bathroom door creak. The score intensifies as a person makes their way up to the shower. When she pulls the curtain back, at first you think it's Jason, but it's really just Andy walking on his hands. Kill him. Yes. He asks her if she wants a beer and walks out of the bathroom, down the hall, on his hands. So Debbie yells at him for leaving the door open. She steps out of the shower, wraps herself in a towel, and closes the door. Bitch, just shower with the door open. Yeah, what you'll be okay. What is wrong with people? You'll be okay. I don't get it. Out in the hallway, Andy's making his way down the hall. Debbie calls out to him and asks if he's still there. Before he has a chance to answer, he looks up, sees Jason, and takes a machete to the dick. I wrote, he gets his taint and butt chopped. <laughs> And Uh, then I said, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Now we don't have to see this douchebag walk on his hands anymore. Yeah. Debbie hears someone and calls out to Andy, telling him to stop messing around. But she never opens the curtain to take a look out. She just keeps telling him to knock it off. If I'm in the shower and I think there's something going on outside the shower, I open the curtain to make sure there's nothing out there. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's not hard. I mean, it... If there was something going on out there, like, really, what would you do? Spray them with hot water and shoot soap in their eye. Oh, you got a plan. (laughs) Debbie turns off the water, whips open the curtain, but instead of Jason, it's just nothing there. Fake scare. She gets out, dries off only her chest, and then puts on a rope. That's weird, too. That's two movies in a row where people have done stupid things in the shower. Yes. As she walks back to their room, she keeps talking to Andy without an answer. So she's walking down the hall where her boyfriend just got his taint chopped with a machete. And there's no blood. Yeah. I noticed that, too. Like, I bet the taint bleeds a lot. Well, he split him in half. Yeah. (laughs) Is she just, like, really non-observant? Well... (laughs) In the bedroom, she picks up a magazine, lays in the hammock to read. Oh, not just any magazine. Fangoria. Oh, that's right. It was Fangoria. And she flips open to a page about the genius of Tom Savini. Aw, that's cute. I love Tom. Red splotches start to fall on the page as she's reading. She's confused. She touches it, rubs it between her fingers, and then asks, where is this coming from? Well, All before she looks up. It's not coming from below, so I'll give you another guess, Debbie. She looks up and sees Andy's mutilated body on the rafter above her. She barely has time to react before a hand grabs her forehead and a knife plunges her through the chest from behind. Yeah. A la Kevin Bacon. It's a good one. Chris and Rick continue to make their way back to the cabin. Chong pops some awesome 3D popcorn, and he takes the lid off, and tries to grab kernels with his mouth as they pop. And I think this seems like a lot of fun. It does. (laughs) And I'm going to make popcorn later tonight. Yeah. I kind of want to get high and pull the lid off and then just be like, "Ah, ah, ah, ah." I can catch the popcorn. (laughs) Cheech comes into the cabin and asks Chong if he was screaming earlier. He tells her it was probably just Debbie and Andy making sex noises. Then the lights go out, and she asks him to go check the fuse box. He seems scared. He doesn't want to go alone. No. (laughs) But she tells him he'll be fine. So Chong goes to the basement, which is outside. Well, yeah, it's like a cellar. Okay. (laughs) And he keeps repeating to himself that there's nothing to be scared of. And then he walks barefoot in the gross, drippy basement. And what do drippy basements mean? Scary. Demons and shit. Yeah. Upstairs, Cheech hears a noise from outside. She opens the door and Shelly appears. He's bleeding from the neck and he's making gross choking noises. She tells him nice makeup job and tells him to stop fooling around. And then she goes about her business. Shelly collapses to the ground and we see that he stops breathing. Yeah, he's dead. He's dead. But you know, it's the classic boy who cried wolf. Yep. Downstairs, Chong has found a way to his way to the fuse box. And then I put, were fuse boxes even common at this time? Yes, that's how the electricity happens in the house. Yeah, but they they have like switches, not fuses. Oh, I didn't notice that. I, I just thought you meant like a fuse box. I'm like, yeah, that's 
No. I think that's been a thing since Sorry. electricity. Okay, yes. But it looked to me like they had... Like breakers. Like breakers and not fuses. Oh, I don't know. And I just thought, for being a, like old cabin, that's kind of weird. Did you notice all the weird shit that's in this cellar? Yeah. There's a taxidermied skunk. Yeah. Something's going on with Chris's dad. Yeah. He flips the switch, the lights fire up, and behind him we see Jason standing there. Jason throws him into the electric box, and because he's not wearing any shoes and standing in water, that's a wrap on Chong. He gets fried. Back upstairs, the lights start flickering like crazy. Cheech, start- Cheech starts to freak out and asks Shelly what's going on. Shelly continues to play dead. <laughs> yes, he's doing a really good job of it, too. And Cheech's... Cheech- why can't I say Cheech? I don't know. Just call her Chili. That's her name. Okay. Chili gets frustrated and shakes him, but Shelly's dead body slumps over. Cheech runs through the house, calling to Andy and Debbie, telling them that Shelly is dead. She runs upstairs and off camera, we hear her find Andy and Debbie, I assume, because she kind of sounds freaked out. But... Yeah. And then she runs back downstairs and runs for the door. But when she opens it, it's like a fucking tornado outside. Well, I like that she's like, I need to escape the scary house. Oh, shit. The, w- the door blew open in the wind. I can no longer use that escape route. Yeah. Uh, you can still go out in the wind. Yeah. But she looks at it like, well, that, that whole exit has just been closed by the wind. It's done. So she runs back inside and Jason is there to greet her with a red hot poker to the body. And then he like picks her up and carries her off and you're like, oh, you're going to go do that thing where you set up a trap for a body to fall down in front of somebody, aren't you, Jason? Uh-huh. How do they think of these things? I don't know. Chris and Rick arrive at the cabin and notice it seems very quiet. Chris tries to open the door, but something is blocking it. And now they smell something burning. <gasps> oh, no. So Rick pushes the door open and a chair has been propped up to block it. That seems not good. I like to... They're standing out there, and Rick's like, wow, that house looks really quiet. And Chris is like, yeah, I can't believe the wild bunch is already in bed. (laughs) And then Rick goes, well, who are those guys? You never know. And they both laugh like he just made the greatest joke in the history of jokes. And he looks like he's wearing shoulder pads under (laughs) his sweater. I think he was wearing shoulder pads. No, I think he's just broad-shouldered. They go into the kitchen and find the popcorn that was on the stove burning. They're confused as to what's going on. The friends are gone, burning popcorn, no lights. So they decide to separate. Well, that's what you do. That's what the Scooby-Doo team would do. Good job. Rip, Rick makes his way through the cabin, trying lights and calling out to everyone. Then he goes back to the kitchen and tells Chris that everyone has just left them there. And Chris is like, yeah, they wouldn't do that. Um, the van's outside. <laughs> we saw the van. Yeah. And Rick says he's going to go figure out the light stuff. And did you see the yellow paper towels? Oh, I did not. Oh, it was like a roll of pastel yellow paper towels. I want them. Like colored toilet paper. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Oh, when you could just like do your entire room in one color. What? Pastel. Yes. You could have like pink toilet paper, pink fluffy rug in front of the toilet, one of those foam pink toilet seats yep it ew it was like you sit on it and it's like it was like it farted for (laughs) you Uh and then you could have like a pretty thing on your tank cover yes or you could have one of those uh oh like the crocheted like ballerinas that goes over top of your extra roll of toilet Uh paper oh man nostalgia (laughs) Rick goes outside to go to the basement. <laughs> Weird, but it's true. <laughs> we cut back to Chris. She walks through the house calling for Rick, and then she makes her way out to the porch. And I don't get why she's calling for him. He said he was going to go outside. I, I don't know. So she walks around the house going, Rick? But we do get a really cool shot here. So Chris steps out onto the porch, and just around the corner of the cabin, in the shadows, we see Jason holding a hand over Rick's mouth. Okay, cool visual, but when you stop and think about it, you're like, you can still make noise with a hand over your mouth. Like, not to, like, think about it. It's not cool, but it's just, like, to see it because Jason's still in the shadow, so you can't really see him. Like, you You can just just see see his big, dirty hand over Rick's mouth, and you see him, like, struggling, and 
I thought it was cool. It is pretty cool. So Chris steps back inside. Outside, Jason grabs the sides of Rick's head, picks him up, and proceeds to squeeze his head until Rick's eyeball pops out and into our face. Oh, boy. (laughs) This special effect was not very special. No. It looks like something my friends and I could have done in, like, sixth grade. Yeah, it's not great. Chris walks into the living room. Water drips on her. Where is that coming from? (laughs) Why is the house peeing on my head? It's the same line with the blood earlier. Where's this coming from? She heads upstairs while calling out to her friends that that she doesn't know what kind of joke they're playing, but they're wrecking the house. Because upstairs she finds the floor flooded with water. She goes to the bathroom where the water is coming from. She pulls back the shower curtain and discovers the tub is full of bloody water. It's full of bloody water and bloody clothing. Yeah. And so she just picks up one of the bloody pieces of clothing. She sticks her hand in it. It's like, no, you can see what that is, Uh dummy. So then she runs through the house and out the door yelling for Rick. The wind continues to blow. Chris heads for the barn, but the body of one of the gang members falls from a tree in front of her. (gasps) How do they do it? I don't know. So Chris runs back into the cabin. She secures all the windows and blocks the door because the wind is so windy. It's super windy. She backs into her, herself into a corner crying. And she keeps yelling for Rick and asking him to come save her. But then Rick's body comes flying through the window. <laughs> he looks like he was fired out of a cannon. <laughs> he comes flying through the window at like 77 miles like, per hour. Head first. <laughs> Chris runs to him, but then realizes he's dead. At that moment, Jason climbs through the now broken window. Chris sees him and screams and runs upstairs. Go outside. Yes. He's a big dude. I promise you can outrun him. Yes. Or at least outlast him. At the top of the stairs, Chris grabs a giant bookcase and knocks it over to block the steps. (laughs) And I like that (laughs) a whole bunch of books fall on Jason and his body language says, hey, stop it. But books rain down on Jason, and I bet that doesn't feel very good. Although it sounds like it would be nice. It was showered with books. Sounds a lot nicer than it actually is. Yeah. I was showered with books. That sounds lovely. Wow, that sounds fantastic. But then you think about how hard a book is and with those sharp little corners. Oh, and like if the spine hits you directly (laughs) on the head, that would hurt like hell. Chris locks herself in a closet at the end of the hall. It's a giant fucking closet. Like, it's more like a storeroom. Yeah. She moves some clothes, and Debbie's dead body falls on her. She screams, revealing her location to Jason. He uses an axe to chop a hole in the door, and Chris grabs the knife out of Debbie's back and uses it to stab Jason's hand as he reaches through. I really like her ingenuity here. Yeah. Because that's some final girl energy. It it, is. Yes. Yes. It was very obvious that she and Debbie were like besties. And she just pulled that knife out of her dead friend's back. and Like, I will stab the bad man who killed my friend yep. with the knife he killed my friend with. Jason backs up and Chris chases him through the hallway, slashing at him, but only successfully plunges the knife into his thigh. Jason falls down. Chris tries to open the door next to her, but she can't. And Jason pulls the knife out of his leg and throws it at Chris's head just as she finally breaks the door open. Inside the room, she throws a chair at the window to break it. She climbs out the window and starts to fall, but Jason manages to catch her before she can. The two struggle for a moment. He's trying to pull her back in the cabin. She wants out of the cabin. Yeah. But finally, Chris's jacket rips and she falls to the ground. She falls a long ways, too. She does. It's like a 10, 15 foot fall. Yeah. Outside, she watches Jason through the door. And she grabs a chunk of firewood and waits for him to come out the door. She knocks him over the head with it. Jason stumbles and falls. And Chris uses this opportunity to run to her van. It takes a minute to find her keys. But she does. And the van immediately fires up. She speeds down the road. And she almost runs Jason over. But he gets out of the way. He does. And I like that he's limp running. (laughs) He's like, ow, my leg. Ow, my leg. Ow, my leg. (laughs) Yeah. I did. I liked that. 
Jason was vulnerable in this. And he even makes noises. He makes a lot of noises. Like when she hits him with the wood, you hear him go, oh. Mm -hmm. And like when she stabs him, he like grunts and grumbles. Yeah. The van starts to sputter and dies atop a crappy little wooden bridge. I call it the shit bridge. Chris quickly realizes that it's out of gas. And then she flips a switch. I couldn't read what it said, but I'm guessing it was like a backup tank. Yeah, it's like auxiliary fuel tank. And the van starts again. She floors it, but the boards have broken under the van and it can't take off. Jason stalks forward, holding his leg. He reaches Chris's van and sticks his arm through the open window to choke her. Chris is smart, and she rolls the window up, trapping both of Jason's hands. She escapes out the side door and runs away. And then Jason, I like this one. Jason uses his head to smash the window to free his hands. (laughs) My hands are stuck. I headbutt. (laughs) It's funny. Chris runs to the barn with Jason on her heels. He blocks the door, or she blocks the door, but he can easily open it. Once inside, he secures the door again, but more so. He, oh, he barricades that thing. Yeah. Real good. Now Chris is trapped. He begins making his way through the barn, <laughs> smashing through everything looking for her. He has so many feels right here. He's so upset. <laughs> He's, yeah. He's throwing everything. <laughs> and he opens that little closet off to the side in the barn that's yeah. just full of like dining chairs Uh and he just starts like throwing the chairs out you can tell he's so frustrated he's like why can't i just kill this girl he's mad (laughs) chris hides above him on a beam and instead of just staying there she decides she needs to shimmy her way across the beam and then she falls down on top of jason she falls taint first (laughs) into the camera too (laughs) and she tackles him to the ground She tries to run to the door, but she can't get the wood block to move. She climbs the ladder to the loft, uses a hay bale to block the opening, and hides with a shovel. Jason easily makes his way to the loft. From behind, Chris knocks him in the head with a shovel. It it looks like she just barely taps him with it. Boop. (laughs) (laughs) He falls and lands right in front of the loft door. Chris uses the rope from the pulley, wraps it around Jason's neck, and pushes him out the door. Jason's body falls, but the rope catches him by his neck. Yeah, he's hanging. (laughs) Chris goes downstairs and manages to get the door open. Jason's body is hanging right in front of the door. We think he's dead, but suddenly his arms reach up. This is a badass scene. Yeah. (laughs) Suddenly his arms reach up. He pulls his body up on the rope and gets the noose back over his head. In He's pro- a strong boy. I know. In the process, his mask slips off for a second. Chris sees his face and realizes he's her monster. O-M-G. Oh, no. And it's like he looks nothing like he did in part two. <laughs> she runs to a corner, and right when you think she's going to get it, Ali jumps on Jason. But he doesn't last very long. Jason cuts his arm off, and then off camera, we hear him continually stabbing him, like a lot. This is the second time we've not seen Ollie get killed. (laughs) Chris picks up an axe and buries it into Jason's head. He grunts, and this is where I put, I like that he makes noises. Yeah. He stumbles forward a few steps before falling to the ground dead. And I like when he's stumbling forward, he has like Frankenstein's monster arms. Yeah. He's like, (laughs) Next, we see Chris on the shore getting into a canoe. She wakes up the next morning screaming and thrashing. And everything is scaring her. Yes. She's still in the canoe. And then (laughs) we get lots of little fake scares. Like a log brushes up against the canoe and that scares her. Loud frogs scare her. And then like a duck flies onto the pond and that scares her. It was a very scary mallard. Yeah. She looks back at the cabin and sees Jason in the window. He's bloody and maskless. He spots her in the canoe and hurries downstairs and out the door to get her. And I like that instead of opening the door, he just runs through it. (laughs) He's on a mission. (laughs) Chris screams and paddles for her life. Then she turns back around and realizes there's nothing there. She relaxes. And then a skeletal Mrs. V jumps from the water and grabs Chris and pulls her in. How did she get her head back on? I don't know. (laughs) So later, two officers discuss that Chris is the only survivor. They bring Chris out of the cabin and into a police car. 
Chris doesn't say anything, but varies between laughing and screaming in fear. Uh Uh-huh. And as they drive off, the camera pans back to Jason's dead body in front of the barn. And then it ends with a really not needed shot of the lake. Uh Uh-huh. I, I don't understand because like they focused on Jason's dead body for so long. I was like, oh, his hands yes. gonna twitch or something, yeah, or like he's gonna like roll onto his back. Or... I, I think just a little hand twitch would have been awesome. Yeah, but it just focuses on him. And then they're like, did you know this takes place at a lake? Yeah, let's look at the lake for a second. And then it's the end. Uh huh. It's a good movie. <laughs> I I also wrote here right before I wrote credits. Wow, that was too many fucking endings. <laughs> It was. They ended that movie like six times. Yeah. All right. So for that cinema, what do you call it? A cinemagraphic? Cinemagraphic. A, that, for that cinemagraphic masterpiece, we have a body count of 12. Yeah. That's a good body count. Harold, he had his chest cleaved. Edna got stabbed in the head with her knitting needle. Fox got a pitchfork to the neck. One of the gang dudes, the white one. The white motorcycle man. (laughs) Got a pitchfork to the gut. I wrote pitchfork tummy ache. (laughs) Vera got harpooned in the eye. Andy got a machete to the dick. Debbie got stabbed from beneath. I put hammock stabbing. Chong got electrocuted. Shelly got his throat slit off screen. Yeah. Cheech got a poker through the body. Rick got his head crushed. I pop. And Ali, stabby, stabby. It, he might not be dead. I mean, he <laughs> lived through that exact same thing before. Mandy, what were your reactions? This is going to shock you, but I think this might be the best Friday movie we've watched yet. I think it's the most entertaining. And then I put, well, as good as it can be. <laughs> I, I definitely think it's the most entertaining. Uh, Jason becoming Hockey Mask Jason was pretty awesome. Yeah. The 3D aspect was pretty cheesy but it also kind of added to the campiness of it oh and can you imagine seeing that in the theater yeah. it would have been so much fun this is just your typical 80s slasher there's no character development just kill i think the motorcycle gang was a weird addition uh-huh like it, they just had them in there as more people to kill the history of the cabin with chris was an odd choice too so she had encountered jason before and survived yeah how I have lots of questions about this. Maybe he just took her back to his shack and was like, do you want to meet my mom? (laughs) And then she was like all passed out and he was like, fuck it, I'll just take you back to the woods. Yeah. Those were my thoughts. My thoughts were, it's bad, but it's fun. Uh, Chili was probably the best actor out of the bunch. And boy, that really doesn't say much for the rest of the cast. If I were to have my ultimate horror movie adult sleepover, this would be one of the movies I'd have. (laughs) Because it's just fun, and you can sit there and like make fun of it the whole time with your buddies. Yeah. It's a bad movie, but I want to say the score and the stalking scenes were definitely saving graces in it. Yeah. I really liked the score. Mm -hmm. And I liked that this time Jason was stalking people and not just like, ah, run up out of the woods and kill you. Yeah. And I bet the 3D was a really good time. But, you know, that doesn't transfer over to home viewing. Nope. Do you have any production facts to tell us? I do. I have several. This was Paramount's first 3D film since Ulysses in 1954, 28 Uh, years earlier. It's a long time. It is. This was supposed to continue the Jenny storyline from part two. And it sounds like it would have been a really good ripoff of Halloween, too, Mm -hmm. because Jenny was going to be in a psych ward, and then Jason finds her and starts killing all the people in the hospital. Hmm. I've seen that before. Yeah. Part three is the only Friday the 13th film in which none of the characters actually say the name Jason. Maybe this is because part three takes place one day after part two. And Jason's legendary slasher exploits are effectively still developing over a long weekend. I like that this was Jason's long weekend. (laughs) Hey, Jason, what'd you do this weekend? (sighs) Tracy Savage, who played Debbie, said the key priority in every scene was making sure the 3D effects worked. 
It didn't matter how the lines were delivered. It didn't matter if our performance was not perfect. We never did a second take. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it shows. <laughs> They hired a new stuntman to play Jason because they were too cheap to pay Jason from Part 2's airfare to California. Oh, boy. (laughs) Uh, For release in the non-3D equipped theaters, Paramount paid nearly $2 million to convert the movie to standard format. $2 million. That was the budget for the movie. Okay, I have, by some estimates, Paramount spent between 8 to $10 million to get part three into theaters. They ended up making, supplying, and installing the necessary equipment that required, for, or that was required for the 3D in all 1,079 theaters that showed the movie opening weekend. That's insane. They also had to train projects, projectionists. That's a hard word. I think all words are hard for you. <laughs> And they had a 24-hour hotline for theaters that encountered problems. Wow. So in order to show this shitty-ass movie, they had to go in and equip all of these theaters. So they spent $2 million making the movie. Yep. They spent $2 million converting the movie from 3D to standard format for the theaters that wouldn't convert to 3D. And then they spent up to $10 million. For this movie. Uh Uh-huh. Wow. That's crazy. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have any more facts. I don't either. Whoa. Simpatico. Mandy, did you have any goofs? No. Oh, I do. Oh, I'm sure. This is supposed to take place the day after part two, but Jason seems to have grown quite a bit (laughs) and also shaved his head. Yeah. He's beefy. He's, He's massive. So, when Vera takes Shelly's wallet, yeah, she's wearing tan pants. She puts the wallet in her tan pants after she gets it back from Foxy. And then later, she's wearing pink pants, and she reaches into the pocket because she's sitting on something, and she just pulls out Shelly's wallet. Maybe she moved it when she switched her pants. She, I think she just stole that wallet. <laughs> Um, the popcorn gets put into a bowl, mm-hmm. and then a few shots later, we see it burning on the stove. Maybe he didn't get all of it into the bowl. Oh, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, those were my goofs. That's not bad. Who, who are you? I'm Howard. <laughs> I'm going to snuggle the animals. I'm going to eat all the snacks, and I'm going to take a poop. Seem- I'm Howard. Seems fair. Who did you say I was? Don't say I'm Shelly. Mandy, don't say I'm Shelly. It's not okay. No, okay, listen to me, though. I said Cam is Shelly because he will gladly perform stupid pranks in order to get attention. Oh, yeah. And he'd stand up to a dude by running over his motorcycle. Yeah. That would be your, like if you were like, I'm going to get him back. You'd be like, <laughs> I'm not going to hit him. I'll just run over his bike. Okay, maybe I'm a little bit Shelly. Yeah. Why do I always hate the person that you say I am? <laughs> Do I need to go to a shrink? No, it's okay. Who do you think you are? I put that I'm Cheech and Chong. (laughs) You're both of them? (laughs) Smoke. Don't hang out with the rest of the group. (laughs) Eat some popcorn. I I wrote Mandy is chili. She's going to sit around, make fun of her man, eat some popcorn, rag on Shelly, and be stoned. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We know you. (laughs) And did you notice uh, Chili's awesome cowboy boot necklace thing that she was wearing? No. She was wearing, it was just like a little rope necklace, uh-huh. but it had a huge cowboy boot, like, keychain on it. <laughs> I'm going to aspire to be Chili when I grow up. <laughs> All right. It's final thoughts and ratings time. Mandy, what were your final thoughts? I put, given a bigger budget. Well, at least a 3D-less budget. Yeah. And better actors. I think this could have been a decent movie. I think it was shot pretty well. The plot was as good as to be expected. I definitely would have liked some more of background on the Chris Jason thing. Uh Uh-huh. I just don't get it. I don't either. And once again, I think the gang was a weird addition. Mm Mm-hmm. But the acting? Oh, boy. Oof. 
both Chris and Debbie, anytime they were on screen, it felt like an after school special. Oh, yeah. It felt like those old uh, Just Say No to Weed commercials. Yes. Like the weed, not even once. Yeah. But overall, I don't think it's too bad. I didn't give a rating to this. Hmm. I'll think about my rating while you do yours. Okay. I gave this movie a three. I took five whole points off for acting. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it's horrible, but I love watching it. And when you need a good cheesy 80s slasher movie itch scratched, this is a pretty good scratcher for that. Yeah. Watching it with a friend is a blast because you can just sit there and make fun of it and quote it. Yeah. And I'd say with better acting, this movie could be a seven. Mm-hmm. But the acting is just so bad. It's terrible. But I really like the score. I like the stalking scenes. I really liked the setting. The setting was good. Mm-hmm. Like having the barn out there. Yeah. It's a ways from the house, well, but it's not too far. And one thing I'll give this movie credit for that the other two, like when it was nighttime, you could tell what was happening. Yes. But I think they had to light it better for the 3D. Oh, probably. So that was probably why. Yeah. Yeah. I gave it a three. I'm well, going to give it a four. Four? Yeah. So we got a 3.5, which actually I think that's what we rated uh, <laughs> Friday too. Yeah. Did you have anything else to say about this cinemagraphic masterpiece? I don't think so. Other than I just coined a new word. You did. I think we should just keep using it. Okay. So if you guys want to visit us on the internet, you can go to our website at FranchiseFrightsPodcast.com or you can swing by Facebook, Instagram, or Blue Sky at Franchise Frights Pod, X and Snapchat at F Rights Pod. And guys, next Thursday... We're going to get Mandy's thoughts on her first ever watch of Saw 3. I'm nervous. It's, it's, oh, I love it. I'm nervous, but excited. So do all of the sharing, do all of the rating and reviewing. Share, share, share. And until next Thursday, remember, remember they, they always, always come, come back. back. Friday the 13th movie higher than I did. <laughs>